Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. Today we're going to be checking out the new 3-rail O-scale EMD F7s from Atlas. Alright, so here we've got yet another beautiful model from Atlas O. I don't think I've ever seen them put out anything that wasn't beautiful. Now, before we get started on the Atlas model of the EMD F7, let's talk about the real EMD F7. The F7 was a 1500 horsepower diesel locomotive that was manufactured by the Electromotive Division of General Motors between 1949 and 1953. The F7 was the fourth model in EMD's popular line of F-unit diesels and was by far the best-selling cab unit of all time, with more of them being built than all other F-Series units combined. A total of 2,366 cab units would eventually be built, along with 1,483 cabless booster B units. So in total, there were almost 4,000 F-7 units built. Although those nearly 4,000 F7s were purchased by almost every major railroad in North America, the two railroads that ordered the most F7s were the Santa Fe, which is what we've got here, as well as the Southern Pacific. Now, when the F7s were produced, they succeeded the popular F3 diesels, and then later on they would be replaced by the F9s. Now, while there are a few external differences between the earlier F3s and the F7s, they are nearly identical looking on the outside, so telling them apart can be a bit of a challenge. Most of the differences between the F3s and the F7s have to do with what's on the inside, with the F7s benefiting from an improved and upgraded electrical system. These upgrades meant that while the F3s and the F7s both had 1,500 horsepower, the F7s had a continuous tractive effort that was 20% higher than that of the F3s. Now, although the F-series of diesels were originally designed for freight service, they, of course, ended up being used quite often in passenger service. And when it came to the F-7s, they hauled some very famous passenger trains, including the Santa Fe Super Chief and El Capitan. What's really amazing about the F7s is that they've had an incredibly long life. Normally with an engine that was last produced in 1953, I'd be telling you when they eventually went out of service, but that's not the case with the F7s. Although they were eventually phased out of service on all major railroads, even today there are a handful of F7s that are still in revenue service on one or two short line railroads. One such railroad that still has an F7 on its roster, at least from what I've read, is the Grafton and Upton Railroad in East Central Massachusetts. And, you know, even when the F7s are no longer in revenue service, they will still be around for quite a while because there are many, many F7s that have been preserved, and a lot of those are still in operating condition, running on excursion and tourist trains and so forth. Probably the most famous F7s that are still in service can be found on the Norfolk Southern's Office Car Special, which contains a couple of rebuilt F7Bs. All right, so now that we've gone over some of the history of the real F7, let's talk about the Atlas rendition that we have here. Now, Atlas announced these models in 2015, and they were originally supposed to ship in late 2015. However, there were some production delays for a number of reasons. I know one of the reasons was that they actually improved the tooling to give these things some road name specific details. And so, as a result, these things didn't start arriving until the very end of 2016 and early 2017, earlier this year. But it was worth the wait because these things are absolutely gorgeous, which of course is always par for the course when it comes to Atlas. Now, as you can see, I've got a Santa Fe F7 train going on here. But Atlas has produced the F7 in several different road names. They've got the Santa Fe, like you see here. They've also got Rio Grande. They've got Pensy, Milwaukee Road, Erie, Amtrak. And they've also got an undecorated version if you want to give these things a custom paint job. Now, one of the cool things is that if you get either the Rio Grande or the Amtrak F7s, you can pair those up with the already existing Atlas California Zephyr passenger cars, which they've been releasing and are continuing to release. Those are really, really nice passenger cars. I would use the word exquisite to describe them. I've actually reviewed a couple of their California Zephyr cars in the past. They are absolutely outstanding, so it would be really cool 
to pair those up with some Rio Grande or Amtrak F7s. Now, of course, if you use the Rio Grande F7s, you'll want to use the classic California Zephyr cars with the Burlington or Western Pacific or Rio Grande. And if you get the Amtrak F7s, you'll want to use the later Amtrak California Zephyr cars that Atlas has also produced. But yeah, that would be really cool. I could have done that myself. Like I said, I've got about 10 California Zephyr cars in my collection. But I chose to get the Santa Fe F7s just because they're so darn cool looking and I've always wanted sort of a Super Chief F7 set in my collection. Now, one kind of cool thing about these F7s is that each unit is sold separately. So what you're seeing here is not a single set that I bought. I bought four different engines. What I've got here is a powered A unit up front. There's a powered B unit behind it. Then behind that, there's an unpowered B unit. And then at the end, there's another powered A unit. So I've got an ABBA set going on, but I bought each of these units individually. That means that you can make up any sort of consist you want. You can even mix and match road names if you want, which could be prototypical depending on what era you're modeling. But yeah, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to do ABBA like I've got here. You could do AA, you could just do an A, or you could do ABA, ABBA like I've got, or anything in between. It's entirely up to you. You heard me say that some of these units are powered and some of them are non-powered. Atlas has produced both powered and non-powered versions of both the A and the B units. And there are several different road numbers available for each type of unit. So you don't have to do all powered units in your train. If you want to save a little money, you could do power to A units at each end and non-powered B units in the middle. Again, what I've got here, I've got three powered units and one non-powered unit, but you can do anything you want, and that goes for every road name they make. They've got lots of road numbers available and lots of options in terms of powered or non-powered. So now let's go over some stats and facts on these models, starting with the A units. Now both the powered and the non-powered A units have a length of 12 inches, and they have a minimum required curve of 036, at least according to Atlas's website. Now the powered unit has a weight of four pounds, two ounces. It is powered by two flywheel motors on the inside. It has a fan-driven smoke unit for the smokestacks. It has the Electric Railroad Company's Cruise Command on board so that you can run these things with either TMCC or Legacy and it also has an improved rail sound system. Now if you've never heard the rail sounds package on an Atlas engine it's sort of like an abbreviated version of the full-fledged rail sounds package that you would get on a modern Lionel engine. So you get the engine sounds and the RPM sounds, you get the sounds of the couplers being thrown and stuff like that. But all of the extra sounds like crew talk sounds and stuff like that are very abbreviated and there are only a few choices to choose from. But it still sounds very good and it definitely sounds better than the old school rail sounds that Atlas used to use three or four years ago. When it comes to the non-powered A units, they look exactly the same as the powered units. They just have different road numbers and they also weigh less. Where the powered units weigh four pounds, two ounces, the non-powered A units only weigh three pounds. And that's because there's nothing on the inside. There are no motors, no sound boards, no cruise commander, no smoke unit. It's basically just an empty shell. The only thing that the non-powered A units have is some basic lighting up front. It's not dynamic lighting so it will not change when you change the direction of the train, but it is there and it is a nice touch. And if you want to, you can disable it with a switch that's on the underside of the engine. And then the only other difference is that where on the powered A units, they have an operating electrocoupler on the front. On the non-powered A units, that electrocoupler does not work. Turning to the B units, both the powered and non-powered B units have a length of 11 and 7 eighths of an inch, and they have a minimum required curve of 045, according to the Atlas website. The powered B unit has a weight of 4 pounds, and on the inside it shares a lot in common with the powered A unit. It's got two flywheel motors, it's got a fan-driven smoke unit, it's got the cruise commander for legacy or TMCC operation, and it's got the improved rail sounds. One question I'm often asked about powered B units is whether or not they are a standalone engine. The answer to that question is yes, this is a standalone engine. You do not need to run it with the A units or any other unit. You can run it all by itself. It is completely independent. 
Just like with the A units, the non-powered B units look exactly the same as their powered counterparts, but of course they are empty on the inside, and because of that they do weigh less. Where the powered B units weigh 4 pounds, the non-powered B units weigh 2 pounds 15 ounces. As we go in for a closer look on these models, starting with the A unit on the pilot here, we've got some nice casting details going on. There is a separately applied cup or cut bar. There's a separately applied air hose on the other side of the coupler. And then of course in the middle we've got the big electro coupler that can be thrown from the Legacy or TMCC remote. Now one of the really cool features of these Atlas F7A units is that when you open the box you'll find one of these. This is a replacement pilot. It is a fixed scale pilot with a scale coupler up front. And if you want to, what you can do is remove the more unrealistic looking O-gauge pilot that swings out over curves and has this big O-gauge coupler and in its place install a fixed scale pilot and therefore get a much more realistic look to the front of your train. Now if you do this, you'll lose the ability to couple O-gauge cars to the front of the A unit, but most of the time that's not going to matter anyway because really this thing is so beautiful that you really don't want to run anything in front of it anyway. Now, if you do make the transition, you need to know that it is a one-way transition. If you install the fixed pilot, you can't go back to the O-gauge pilot because in order to install the fixed pilot, you have to remove some structure needed to support the O-gauge coupler. So once you do it, you can't go back. But I've done it before on my Atlas F3s and it looks great and I did not regret doing it. Now. I'm not going to show you how to do the installation because when I reviewed the Atlas F3s a while ago, in that video I showed you how to install these fixed pilots. So if you want to find out how to do the installation, just go back and watch that review video. Now we come to the most iconic part of the F7, which is of course the nose, because we've got that great war bonnet logo on the front. And as you can see, the paint job on this thing is fantastic. We've got a couple of separately applied metal grab irons on either side of this molded in door. The door doesn't open, of course, but we do have a nice add-on door handle. We've got a couple of lights here. This is a headlight and this is a blinking Mars light. On either side here, we've got lighted number boards. We've also got operational marker lights. And then up top here, we've got add-on windshield wipers. As we round the corner, you can see we've got some very nicely detailed die-cast metal truck side frames. We've got a little add-on ladder here. You'll see lots of these on all of the units. We've got some separately applied metal grab irons on either side of the door. These doors don't open, but they look nice nonetheless, and we've got some nice detailing down here. There are lots of nice molded in details on these engines. All of the windows have clear plastic inserts in them. Down here you can see we've got a legible builder's plate. Got a little F here to denote that this is the front of the engine in case you didn't know. And then back here we've got the start of this excellent metal grill work. You'll see more of this. We've got a little porthole window. Now you can't see through it, it's blacked out, but for good reason because you don't want to look through and see a bunch of electronics inside. And then right here you can see the start of this great paint job going down the side of the engine. As we move on down, you can get a good look at this great metallic finish that Atlas is using on these Santa Fe models. I think it looks fantastic. We've got some hand-painted detailing down here on the fuel tank. There's lots of legible signage going on. We've got some more molded-in detailing, another porthole window, another door with separately applied grab irons on either side. We can see more of this incredible metal grill work up here. We've got another couple separately applied metal grab irons back here, and then we've got a couple add-on ladders as well. And here's a look at the back of the A unit. Down here we've got a dummy O-gauge coupler. And again, for you newbies, a dummy coupler is one that does not operate. It is in a fixed closed position. Then we've got some great looking MU hoses on either side. We've got a couple of separately applied grab irons. We've got some nice molded in detailing up here. And then we've got this nice diaphragm. As you can see, it moves a little bit. And then there's a molded in door in the middle. It looks great. Now let's check out the top of the engine. Up front, we've got a couple of separately applied horns. They look really nice. We've got this great paint job up here. It looks fantastic. Then we've got some separately applied lift rings and a great looking fan here. And you can see there's some nice molded in rivet detailing as well. 
Here in the middle, we've got more of these great looking fans, and then we've got two exhaust stacks, and both of these stacks go down to the fan-driven smoke unit that's in this engine. And as always, to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit, all you do is pour the smoke fluid directly down either one of these stacks. And then moving on toward the back, we've got some more molded in detailing and some nice add-on lift rings. Here's a quick look at the underside of the powered A unit. As you can see, we've got four pickup rollers, two per truck. We've got two traction tires on the inner axle of each truck for a total of four. And then the speaker for the sound system is right here. Right here is a knob for the master volume control. You probably can't see it very well from that angle, but it's right there. And then under this rear truck, we've got four switches, two on each side. Right here, we've got the run program switch. This is the sound on off switch. You can turn the sound off if you want. And then on the other side, we've got the smoke unit on off switch and the conventional cruise on off switch. Okay, so that takes care of the A unit. Now we'll take a closer look at the B unit. However, the B unit is pretty much the same as the A unit. It just doesn't have a cab. There are only a few little differences here and there. We've got the nice diaphragms at both ends of the unit and both of the couplers are the non-operating dummy type. On the side here we've got three porthole windows instead of two and the one in the middle has molded in hinges on it. And then in the middle of the B unit we've got this really nice Super Chief emblem. I really like that. It looks awesome. And then up on the roof, we've got some extra detailing that is not present on the A unit. The underside of the powered B unit looks a lot like the underside of the powered A unit. We've got four pickup rollers, two per truck. We've got four traction tires, two on each inner axle. The speaker for the sound system is right here. Once again, you probably can't see it, but the master volume knob is right here. And then back here under the rear truck, we've got those four switches. There's run program, there's the switch to turn the sounds on and off, there's a switch to enable or disable the smoke unit, and then there's a switch to enable or disable conventional cruise. And by the way, the conventional cruise switch, that only applies if you're running this engine conventionally without TMCC or Legacy. If you're running this in command control mode, you don't have to worry about that switch. Okay, we're just about ready to fire this thing up, but before we do, it's time for BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. Well, my pick for best feature this time around is definitely the optional scale pilots that come with all of the A units of these models. I think it's a really cool feature. You know, I love three rail modeling, but one of the downsides, unfortunately, is that we do have to deal with those big unrealistic O-gauge couplers and the swinging pilots, and those can serve as a distraction to an otherwise beautiful scale model. And so with these, it kind of softens the blow a bit. You can put one of these on the front, you can put some scale couplers in between the units, and then you get a much more realistic look. It's really cool, and so that's why this is my pick for best feature. All right, we're ready to start this thing up, and look at that, I couldn't resist. I installed the fixed pilot on the lead unit. Now, the way I've got this thing set up in my legacy remote is that each powered unit has its own ID because each powered unit, as I said, is its own independent engine. So I've got three powered units in this consist, the lead A unit, the B unit here, and then the trailing A unit. And so using those three IDs in my legacy remote, I built a train. So I'm going to run these as a train. So let's go ahead and start it up. Let's check out the horn.
sound effects. As I said before, the sound set on these engines is sort of an abbreviated legacy rail sounds. So there's only a couple of crew talk sound sequences. Let's go ahead and check them out. time to have some fun so let's go ahead and move it out.
right, that about wraps it up for this review. These are absolutely gorgeous models, and again, it's par for the course when it comes to Atlas. Now, if you're interested in purchasing these, the powered units, regardless of whether it's an A or a B unit, have a retail price right at $500. And the non-powered units, again, regardless of whether it's an A or a B unit, have a retail price right at $220. And you can get these from your favorite Atlas dealer. Or for more information, you can go to www.atlaso.com. Anyway, that's about it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. To discuss this model or any other O-Gage trains and to meet other O-Gage modelers, check out the O-Gage Railroading Magazine online forum at ogrforum.ogagerr.com.